It works. <laughs> I saw that upstairs, and I was like, I can't want one of those. All right, so hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I'm really honored to be the closing keynote here at Indicate East. Um, thanks so much to the organizers, everybody. It's emotional. I'm feeling, oh, God, there's so much love in the room. Um, but uh, And especially thanks to Clara and Matthew for um, the gracious invitation to uh, uh, speak to you all tonight. So. Um, I have a few interesting stories to tell, uh, and uh, tonight, of course, I'm here to talk about diversity in audience and diversity in creators, and I want to just talk about what diversity in games might mean, starting today from spinning my uh, particular situation that's going on right now uh, into the near past, incorporating history, technology, and some intriguing recent research uh, from my Tilt Factor lab uh, at Dartmouth College. So that's what I'd like to share with you today. So some of you may know that I uh, found and lead the Tilt Factor lab. This is actually from Indicade um, a couple of years ago, I think, when we played Awkward Moment there, um, the West version. Um, so <laughs> it's a warm out. <laughs> uh, so you can tell everyone's happy and not wearing puffy outfits. Um, you know, there's not ice in your face. Um, so um, I founded Tilt Factor over a decade ago at Hunter College in New York City, um, and now it's at Dartmouth College. And we're unusual because we make and study games and investigate them for evidence of outcomes. So in other words, you know, do the games do what we think they would do? And not just be fun and playful and interesting, because of course playtesting is uh, making sure that that happens all the time. Um, but we study games with a psychologist team and random con randomized controlled experiments, and only produce those games for which we have evidence of real impact or real effects, such as changing players' minds, uh, emphasizing certain beliefs or habits, and so on. Uh, we address climate change, public health, and that kind of stuff. But first, as a, I'm a game designer, right? And I'm an artist, so I, I really want those experiences to be rich and meaningful. And then second, perhaps they, uh, you know, I believe none of the science is really relevant unless the games themselves are good. And that's, um, that's one of my main ethos. As a game designer, I have a 20-year uh, history developing urban games, card games, sports, etc. Some of the games are featured here. Um, uh, they, these go back, I, I, actually, Carl Goodman noted that these games go back as far as Josie True, which was from the 90s, um, and so were these uh, Discovery Channel things. There's a lot of different kinds of games. So I've, I've been doing this for a long time. And, um, uh, in addition to game design, I just put this in here because some of you may know me through these books and what have you, but may not know that I'm an artist. And I'm just playing these uh, little videos to give you a sense of some really old work, so some new work. Um, domestic, one of my uh, uh, game engine uh, art, uh, autobiographical projects. This perpetual bed was a, a spatialized narrative project from the 90s in VRML. Um, my joystick right now is in, people ask me, where's your joystick? Um, which is a weird question I like ask people on the street. My joystick sculpture is in Karlsruhe in Germany right now. It, uh, apparently someone must have fallen off because they have built a strange cage around the joystick. It doesn't come that way. And, um, and this one, this is a, a, a touring exhibition called Free Play, which is going around the next two years with a bunch of artists collected, including Ar Corey Archangel um, and uh, uh, possibly other people in this room. I'm not even sure who else is in that exhibition. And this is a project called Bomb Scotch, where uh, you are drawing um, bombs, uh, uh, bomb-sized hopscotches to think about uh, American um, violence uh, uh, around the world. It's kind of political. Okay, so anyway, so, <laughs> but this talk tonight um, at the close of Indicate is about diversity, and I, so I want to uh, talk um, from the experience of working on two new games tonight. So first, some of you know that right now I have a Kickstarter campaign uh, for a board game I'm launching this year. Note. Thank you. <laughs> it's called Monarch. Um, this is art from Monarch. Um, so in Monarch, players play as heirs to the throne. Your mother, the queen, has lived out her years and soon will pass on the crown, and the time has come for you and your sisters to, de to demonstrate your intelligence, compassion, bravery, and strength as leaders. So, so players choose strategy uh, based on how they think that they can prosper in the game, and they build a court in order to um, show, that, show their bounty and who, is, who will be the next queen, right? So it's, it's uh, players playing as sisters. Um, to vie for the for the throne. Okay, so some interesting things going on with this recent um, project of mine that I think shed light on what it means to think about diversity in games. Well, but first, before getting to the story about the Kickstarter, which uh, uh, which has lots of implications for all of us in the room, I want to share with you some research that we did in some controlled experiments. So, so we took prototypes of the game um, before the luscious art 
uh, created by Kate Adams, who's a RISD graduate. Shout out for RISD. Um, not that I went there, but I'm just a fan. Um, <laughs> um, and, and we have some really interesting data that I like. You know, I'm, I, I, I have to throw a chart in because of all this data. You know, we got some charts here. All right, so, so what we did is we actually took Monarch to all boys schools. Um, and we decided to test Monarch and playing as a queen um, with all male players, um, teenage male players. So we studied the full prototype of Monarch in these experimental studies involving young men at various New England schools. So in study one, we changed the timing of a revelation of the character's gender with an all male youth sample. Okay, so, so at first, uh, one condition we told the players, okay, you play as princesses, okay, very upfront. And the other condition, we actually told the players that they were playing as siblings, and then throughout the gameplay, they realized they were playing as sisters because the cards address them as sisters. There's a card at one point um, that says uh, that says that you know you are you and your sisters you know receive something. So it's interesting if you start to look at um, how the players in these controlled experiments decided that they would report on the game. So for, so, so, so for example, how the players described the game afterwards as rewarding or worth playing again. Um, you see that the delayed reveal, i.e. calling it, um, saying that you're playing as siblings, actually helped boys get into the game more um, than giving them explicit instructions to play as princesses, right? And they also, um, having that kind of neutral kind of thing about you're playing as siblings, actually lowered the way in which they thought it was the game should be for girls or should be for boys and girls or both, right? So it's this interesting thing about the delay reveal. This is backed up by some psychology literature and, and storytelling and narrative, which says that we can actually do something called experience taking better when we don't have explicit markers of difference between us and a character. So for example, if you start to read a book and you find out that the character right away is very different from you, it's not this, it, it, it actually prevents us from um, kind of bonding with that character more than if we can make certain assumptions and have those assumptions proved wrong. So this, these findings are consistent with the psychology literature but may not be that instinctive for the designer. Um, and and these, these notions uh, using experience taking scales from psychology do show that delayed response actually does increase this, this phenomenon of experience taking. Now these are measures that are taken from psychology literature, so that if you're, some people are really curious about how you get these measures, so there's a whole group of people in psychology who make these measures available and show you how to use them, so uh, we can always talk afterwards about that if you're, if you're one of those people who's really curious. And here, um, we did another thing with this study, and we actually asked people if um, it, it, that we, we, we presented 10 sentences uh, identifying a, a short work of fiction, and then we left a blank, and people could fill in the rest of the story, basically, the rest of a sentence. So the sentences are written in such a way that they invite the use of personal pronouns, right? So it's a pronoun study. So for example, the tears ran down Arlu's face. Imagine this is the first line of a story, and then you write the second line, so you may say, um, and he felt the pain of uh, the sword in his leg. <laughs> or <laughs> whatever it is. So people make this up. Some weird stuff comes out, by the way, but that's just another part of being a researcher. <laughs> so is Arlu a male pronoun or a woman pronoun? Like, so, so this kind of comes out. And if you see, the early reveal, which means telling the players that they are playing as princesses, actually um, get, uh, produced far lower female pronouns <laughs> than the delayed reveal, which is fascinating, actually. So somehow, being told to be playing as princesses shut down some things in those players and, let, and, and didn't let people um, kind of empathize or something like that. And when, the de when there was a delay in the reveal, and we're talking about 13 moves in a, in a four-person board game, um, 13 moves in kind of having this reveal changes how, um, how people actually even think about sentences and language, right? So that's kind of uh, fascinating. Now, now, this study was important for several reasons. It demonstrated that a little ambiguity for players goes a long way in helping them identify with and connect with new play experiences and perspectives. These findings should give you evidence-backed ideas about how to embed ideas of diversity into your games, having people who are different um, than your uh, imagined target audience, maybe this delayed reveal can really help you um, set up a situation of empathy. But most importantly, though, this study proved 
my design instincts wrong. And um, that's what I'd like to talk a little bit more about because um, we're all making things in this room, and um, which is an honor to be able to share um, both the successes and the failures, right? So I'm an experienced designer. And with all of my experience, you know, sometimes as a designer, you're watching players and you have, you know, you, you, you kind of, oh, you know, they're not getting it. They're not into it. Oh, I got to change this. You know, we, 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 we hone our observation skills and how we understand players, right? We, we're, we, we're good at this after a while. And we think we know what works and what doesn't work when we watch players very carefully, when we're being completely honest and saying, I'm going to just, I, I, I know that there's something wrong in the game. I'm iteratively designing. How can I, how can I see this? So the reveal, um, the, the reveal that I'm talking about here in the game happened during a card in the game that stated, if the sisters pay a total of four gold, each sister receives seven gold. So when I watched the players, I was horrified. Right? This comes up in the middle of the study. The, 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 these boys are playing the game, and suddenly it breaks the I, I thought it broke the game. They're like, I'm not your sister, and this other kid's like, oh, you know, I'm not a girl, don't call me your sister, and then they just start bickering about being a sister. <laughs> and it was like they got, they guffawed, what, sister, I'm not a girl, they had this whole performance of something going on. Okay, so I thought, I'm just watching this going on, and you know, I can't do anything, it's in the middle of a study, and I'm like, oh, God, oh. You know, broken game, broken game. We can't have this reveal happen. We can't have the reveal. We're going to have to tell them they're princesses anyway. Uh, it was, it, this broke the game. I, I was convinced. And then we did the data collection and used the psychological measures, and the game actually was transporting them. So what I was seeing as a designer, what I thought was a broken game, was the beginning of a conversation. And that was very important for me to learn, that the game wasn't broken, that those kinds of conversations were actually helping those players facilitate new ways of thinking, and, that, and it showed in the data. And so I, I, I just think that that's an interesting moment where, um, where, where this kind of, these kinds of changes were able to happen because I broke the game and because the reveal um, uh, happened and the game worked better. So this work reminded me um, never to think I know what the players are experiencing. It reminded me, you know, and to tread carefully with my design solutions. Sometimes the non-obvious really works, and sometimes your assumptions, even as an experienced designer, are not what the player is experiencing. So that's theme number one um, for my talk. Study two, we did a study of character stereotypes in art. So we had these two different stereotypes. Um, um, before the game, we gave these all-male teens, um, a different, different sets of all-male teens, um, sample character art images pre-tested to be more or less stereotypically feminine. Um, so in this study, uh, the boys were told before the game that they were princesses, but they were shown an image, one of these two images. And so we found one, this one key difference between the conditions um, the stereotypical and the counter-stereotypical had significant impact on boys' experience of the game, even though the co game content was held constant in every respect but the character image. Boys were shown the counter-stereotypical princess with all the uh, <laughs> um, stuff um, had significant, uh, uh, were more interested in playing again and saw the game as being equally appropriate for boys and girls, and they also reported higher levels of experience taking with their princess character in the game. So even the representation, how we think about princess, you know, it makes sense, but now we have data on it to show that that's actually true. And it's true by pretty significantly, uh, statistically significant margins. And um, there's this also this measure of self-rated androgyny, which is an interesting thing to, to even have. And that um, the, 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 the levels of e players' self-rated femininity traits and masculinity traits in the counter-stereotypical example seem to kind of go up. So fascinating stuff about how we, as designers, can think about um, the way we represent characters. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about ratios of characters a little later in my talk. Um, in my research lab, one of the main things we do is study bias, so how people come to their social biases and how social biases can be changed. So we have evidence um, uh, that we can change several societal biases with games, and sometimes drastically. Uh, Buffalo, the name-dropping game um, that some of you uh, are fans of and like, um, it, yay! Uh, it doubles players' measures on psychological tests 
um, for uh, anti-discrimination and anti-racism. In other words, it lowers players' discrimination um, after playing the game. An awkward moment, the original one over there, um, changes players' unconscious stereotypes by tripling players' associations between women and science. So we're able to do these things in party games. Awkward moment at work, new, was just released yesterday A Toy Fair. Is it yesterday, Saturday? I don't know what day it is. What, one of these days recently. <laughs> It was, it was released at Toy Fair, and this one significantly increases players' to desire to avoid appearing prejudiced to others. So there's a lot of self-censorship we found that um, playing Awkward Moment helped people try to, try to be conscious of their own uh, biases. And again, these psychological measures are done under controlled experimental settings that produce research papers um, that are under peer review. So they're, 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 they're real sets of data. So what does this mean? to move into other kinds. So I'm, I'm thinking about this kind of bias stuff, and what does it mean then to take an independent game that isn't necessarily um, produced um, for, uh, for uh, uh, laboratory reasons only, but this is a game that I've been wanting to make for a long time. What does it mean to get this game into the world out on Kickstarter, given some of these, um, some of these issues that I am interested in about biases and stereotypes and, and uh, equity and diversity? In the next slide, I'll try to explore some of those with you. So there is a study uh, from Kickstarter campaigns from 2009 to 2012. It was actually Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns. And researchers found that women were more successful at reaching their goals. There was a 69.5 success rate versus a 61.4 success rate for men. So I've rounded it uh, uh, in those numbers up there. So it's interesting because um, that hit the, this, these results hit the Wall Street Journal and other main, mainstream media as women are more successful in crowdfunding. Boom, right? That, that was the, 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 the national headlines. Women are more, more successful in crowdfunding. Boom. Well, there are some caveats to this. Women ask for less money. Um, the data, the data, Is it really? I don't. It, yes. So women ask for. <laughs> so women ask for less money. Now, if you look, if you look, the the mean goals of these different groups of people. Two women ask for. I can't even read that. I think it's like ten. Is it ten thousand? Yeah, ten thousand three hundred something or other. Um, one female w w um, is uh, only six. Female to male um, and fe male to female teams uh, ask for the highest. It's pretty amazing differences, aren't they, between um, the just uh, across the board entrepreneurial asks. For, um, for folks in crowdsourcing. Okay, here's another interesting factoid. 83 of all game investors were male. And if you look over here at the divide of the categories, it's the most polemic difference. And the reason this is interesting to me is because I had the first day of my interview for, for first, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. First day of my Kickstarter, it's been a week, right? Yeah, everyone who's done a Kickstarter, like I, I have, I'm surprised I can even speak a, a sentence. Okay, so um, the, first, the first day of my Kickstarter, I, uh, someone set up an interview uh, with a guy who does in, uh, interviews for Kickstarter campaigns, and his first question to me was, I can't, you've made so many games, like, how did you ever make a game without Kickstarter? You know, like, how did you ever, I was like, well, you know, uh, there are other ways, uh, it's, uh, I had some funding, I, uh, you know, I was alive before Kickstarter, that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> there was this moment, it was like a little weird. And then, and, and, and then, and then of course, the, you, I start looking up the data, and he's like, well, you know, everyone does Kickstarters. Everyone in the world, it's, a, it's an egalitarian promise. You know, like, this is the place where it's equitable. Kickstarter is, you know, this is where, like, the level of the playing field, everyone has a chance to kickstart their game. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Great. And then I started, I was really curious because of my Kickstarter experience, the first f 10 people who um, jumped on the Kickstarter bandwagon were all white men. And we have a, a role in the game that's an unwanted guest. And um, you, can pay to be an un you can pay to be drawn as an unwanted guest in the game. And then, um, and, and then you, know, you can be um, sent to your sister's court. So you can actually sabotage your sister by sending her like a drunk uncle or something. So, <laughs> so it's kind of great. You know? So it's a good role to have. And, um, and we had five of those slots. They're all taken in the first week of the Kickstarter all by white men, which is very interesting. My demographic and, and, and who is funding my campaign is not the 
the average, they say that women who kickstart campaigns are often supported by other women. And I, uh, uh, that has not been the case. I mean, I have some women uh, supporters, but overwhelmingly it's male. And I think it's also because that there's just a lot of people who are male who are also investing in games. So there's this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. It's really hard, you know, we, we, we look at, at Kickstarter in these places as, as really places to foster innovation, but we also have to look at what's going in in terms of um, uh, uh, thinking about what, what's possible, what makes a good game, um, what kind of judgments are being used, and whose aesthetics, et cetera. Okay, um, uh, serial investors are more likely to be men also. That's an interesting fact from uh, some of the research, and this research study is down here, and uh, I can always tweet it out or something after the talk if people are interested in looking at this, because it's pretty fascinating. And um, investors are more likely to fund the same gender, except in my case where um, I, I have um, some, uh, I think, a disproportionate number of men. And But that also goes with the number of uh, people on Kickstarter right now. I mean, 82% uh, male is actually even higher than the than the typical visitor who's up um, on Kickstarter and Kickstarter's own uh, demographic uh, breakdown right now. And if you look at the age um, demographics that re Kickstarter is reporting, you know, basically if you're over 34, you're barely alive, <laughs> <laughs> and then you just like <laughs> drop off. Um, <laughs> And just forget about it. And so, so I've been really, so, so just in the last week, I've thought, gosh, you know, this has so many implications for what we think about in terms of diversity in games. Like, if we're really going to this model, we have to ask questions about crowdfunding models. And I'm not the first person to ask questions about crowdfunding models. Bill Cunningham of Gra uh, uh, blackcrowdfunding.net, uh, which went on hiatus, unfortunately, in 2014. You know, there's Black Startup and Crowdismo. These are, these are other groups of people trying to find niche communities because there are all these discriminatory barriers to funding minority businesses, right? So, so crowdfunding has this promise have to be this alternate resource. And, 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 you know, the data all shows that minority-owned firms, for example, are less likely than non-minority-owned firms to receive loans um, and all of this. So, so unfortunately, uh, this this kind of this work didn't pan out, and it hasn't panned out so far. You know, they got a lot of verbal endorsements, people saying, "Yeah, this is a great idea, a great idea," and they didn't really get the money moving. And I have to say that this it, it makes me very worried about this when we have um, uh, you know Silicon Valley saying they're they're trying to hide all their data because they really don't have great stats about who's working in Silicon Valley. It's 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 all a little bit part of this same system of who's who's really um, able to contribute, who has power, and who has who has money. Um, extreme risk has been the word of the week this week as I have uh, taken. Um, uh, uh, monarch over to Toy Fair and talk to some uh, some folks, and I'll I'll I'll. I'll I'll reveal some of those conversations momentarily, because um, that has been a very interesting week for me. All right, so surprisingly, while, while women were instrumental in the history of board game design and continue to be active today, most contemporary games available in toy stores and most games winning awards for magazines and trade or toy store in toy industry associations are not designed by women. Um, we have here some great games that are designed by women. And if you look at the best um, lists from different Mensa, by the way, Mensa is like one guy's opinion. Um, if you <laughs> Just look that one up. Um, anyway, uh, uh, look here. You see not a whole lot of women designers. There's um, Jay Matthews and Structures. And list Game of the Year awards. Here's some games by designer um, from a major board game publisher who shall not be named. Um, just uh, one of the, there are two women listed in this list, and one um, has a blank web page. Um, at the company and it doesn't look like she has been able to make something. So, you know, you can learn a lot about who's getting published and who's getting funded. And, you know, I like to look around and try to find uh, women's names and um, trying to see about, well, what, what's, what's going on here if the best family games uh, are, are, are made by um, not necessarily a very diverse group and they claim to be a game type for everyone. You know, it just keeps going on. I could just give you page after page of this and you could find this is very depressing. Um, um, aside from the crowdfunding issue, you know, we need to consider all the other challenges built into games. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, what I, I, have, I have received a lot of criticism, including Reddit Flame Wars, about uh, Monarch being a game in which all the players play as, as women. Um, it's okay, apparently, if we are playing Letters to Whitechapel and all of the players are men, and that's not a big deal. But even children are noticing <laughs> um, some problematic representation. And this is, this is uh, in, the, in the board game field. Um, I don't know how many of you play Libertalia, for example, or look at these box covers, but I'm not seeing a whole uh, you know, uh, diverse range of, um, of, of characters. So, and so far, Publishers don't seem to have a problem with this. Um, in fact, uh, a large board game publisher recently told me um, that um, Monarch's female characters make the game, quote, unsuitable for players, especially gamers. Uh, <laughs> and here's, here's, here's some of the stuff from Reddit. Um, it seems strange that you want, it's strange. <laughs> I like that. Strange that you want an extremely approachable game, and yet you are playing as a woman no matter what. Don't I worry. I have so much worry that it will turn off a large portion of the male-dominated board game industry. So this person at least is admitting that the board game indus industry is a male-dominated field, unfortunately. But, um, but I think for me, the larger question here is that, you know, this is 2015. I don't think that people at Indicade would have a problem with, all, with four uh, sisters playing in a board game. I think that would be the, the, the tamest thing that we could pos possibly do <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a community. And I think my, my hope is that we can begin to connect these communities and kind of take over. Because we, there, it's just there's no more time, you know? Like, uh, uh, we're all going off the Kickstarter dead end. <laughs> and we need to figure out how to change these systems um, so we can have impact, and we need to do it as a community together. Um, I don't know about you, but after playing um, as an unnamed he in countless rule books and instruction manuals, I'm ready for a change. There's some more monarch art. I'm just pushing the monarch art. It's really awesome. OK. Um, but of course, this is not just a board game problem. So diversity in video games. People are finally talking. Um, at least talking in mass about diversity in gaming, and most of that has a digital focus. Uh, even Kotaku has noticed, although um, even in, as a joke, lumping mentally, being mentally ill with being female, non-white, or gay, I mean, it's an attempt at humorously raising the issue, but um, if that's what it takes, I guess it's okay by me, but um, the vitriolic harassment faced by women in games over the last five months or so is a sure sign that change is here. In some ways, it's a civil rights movement, actually, we have on our hands. Not a right to vote or these other fundamentally, uh, fundamental kinds of rights about education. These are unalien unalienable, and, um, th but they were still profoundly late and coming to people in this country and still being worked on today. But meanwhile, we have these subtle and, and, and more nuanced rights movements afoot about who has the right to play, about who has the right to make games, about who has the right to fantasy in general. Um, and talk about games and write about games, right? So this is the, we're we're at a, a very big um, rights moment, I think, um, that is uh, it's rearing its ugly head, and and it needs uh, it needs our our full most attention, even if it's not directly pointed at us individually. This is one of the inventors of the basic programming language. He's a math professor, and he was the professor at Dartmouth actually. Um, years ago before my life. Um, <laughs> John Kemeny. And this is him looking over a program written by his daughter um, in about 1966. She's using the teletype uh, computer to input her text. And, and his, Kemeny's collaborator, Tom Kurtz, was also a math professor. And the two of them wrote BASIC. Uh, they invented BASIC in 1964. Um, their utopian idea was that everyone could and should learn to program computers. So this is this is this is this history of this goes right back to the beginning of the popularity of uh, even the PC in general, even before the PC computer. So you know, by 1964, language, poetry, toys, large-scale calculations, and yes, games were made with computers. And Basic was meant to be a vehicle to use the promise of new technologies to solve the world's problems. And they were very explicit about this. It wasn't just a kind of geek toy to play. It was about empowerment then. Um, and Kemeny 
uh, has some really interesting things to say in one of his addresses. You know, he in this urge to democratize programming for the masses so that everyone could be an author, this was key to the idea behind BASIC of the ethos of the whole project, the values of the whole project. Um, you know, the Kameny fam family were persecuted Jews who escaped to New York City in, the, in 1940. And intolerance was to him the most heinous crime against humanity, right? This is, this is, this is someone whose very life depended on coming to the United States to escape intolerance and certain death. And on his fi final day as college president in June 1981, he warned students, this is from 1981, he warned students against strangely extended binary thinking <laughs> around, about the world around us. It may be okay for certain code applications, but overall, Kemeny saw code uh, coding and having a voice as an empathetic and political act, and one that should not divide people. Now, you know, when we think about the history of computing, um, and, and when I was learning BASIC, computer games were coming into vogue, some of this democratizing language actually caught on. And you can kind of see there's a very different feel in the air, like games like uh, those created by Atari, marketed to families. Gaming was not the stereotype phenomenon one might think about when we hear about computer games in the news. Um, and and uh, I think the stereotypes were a little, a little bit more messed up um, and, and interesting. And stereotypes, by the way, make me mad, so that's why I do a lot of research on them. Um, so did you know also back in the year 1980 when Nolan Bushnell released the Atari, 40% of Atari customers were female customers? I mean, um, Bushnell, you know, was really looking about like, at like the history of, of the field and said, well, you know, why did the market truncate? Uh, what happened when they lost female gamers? And they, they think about that through time. And of course, we are in some kind of trouble because we have a problem. Not only, not only was the democratizing dream of BASIC never achieved yet, but things are not looking up for the empowerment of people in coding and computer science. To make computer games, we need to code. We need diverse coders and designers. So what is happening when many, many states in the United States do not have people taking the advanced placement science test, or advanced placement computer science test to even get into computer science classes? We're attracting people late, they have low confidence, and, and we're just not getting the kind of attention to thinking about uh, empowerment that we want with technology, at least that I, I hope we want as a community looking back from the 1960s to today. So thinking, I don't know if many of you know about these tests, this IAT test, implicit association tests. But um, there are little tools where we can actually make associations in split-second decisions. And this is how we can change stereotypes and biases in our body or how we can measure them. If you, if you match words, like if you see a black face and you, write, and you, and you immediately say, good, um, you are, you have a one kind, you have a, you're making that association in a split second, right? And studies have shown over and over and over again, this, this test was invented at Harvard um, uh, by a woman named Banaji, uh, Professor Banaji. And she said, she, over and over, this te these tests have been proven to be um, very, very um, accurate. And people have tried to disprove that our bodies can actually um, reveal our biases, and um, they, they, they keep finding that, it, that this test really works. <laughs> um, so, so, so we've shown time and time again that this project implicit uh, measuring, measuring reactions time for, for biases um, is, is, is very effective. And I, I wanted to put this into the talk, thinking about this idea of code and fewer and fewer people. What if we can reprogram this system? What if we can actually change these unconscious biases to be more proactive, to be linking us into more ideas about computer science, and to even think about, gosh, there could be a female character in a game that I might actually play? Can we use these kinds of, of tests to not only measure people's biases, but actually start to change them? And Banaji, the inventor of this system, said, teaching people about the injustice of discrimination or asking them to be empathetic to others is, is and was ineffective. What works, at least temporarily, is providing volunteers with counter-stereotypical messages. So saying, gosh, you know, you're biased isn't enough. But if we come up with new models and new um, systems, this seems to be the way in which we can move forward as a community interested in diversity and change. I'm going to show you one more um, game that I'm working on that isn't a Kickstarter campaign. Um, it's called Luminist. It's part of a project about uh, thinking about women in science and trying to find role models 
for um, players uh, who might be interested in uh, under, you know, kind of finding a role model to get interested in science. So in this game, we wanted to make cool scientific role models who were empowered to travel in time and reinvent society's greatest inventions to save the world from an accidental unraveling of time and space. And so we, of course, had to do some studies on that to see if it was actually effective. So we experimented here with gender and luminous representation and how many um, luminous would be men and women and what that really did to the player's understanding of the game and their interest in the game. So um, in the imbalanced condition, we had six of the eight luminous as female. And in the equal condition, it's four and four. So those are the two groups of luminous. It has a steampunk kind of thing going on. Um, and then we measured to the extent to which uh, youth participants, this is male and female youth participants, saw themselves as being similar to the luminous and capable of achieving their uh, types of success. And, and then uh, we have uh, some interesting data here. OK, so when the representation was imbalanced and skewed towards more women in the game, um, we see, uh, we see, that e we see a, a lower sense of identification with the luminous. But then we also did a test of who, uh, which girls, uh, as part of the study, would be interested in uh, pursuing computer programming. And when there was equal representation of male and female characters, uh, girls' interest went up. So this is interesting. Like, you know, why does having so many female characters in a game suddenly then take away one's interest or one's ability to identify with Luminous? And here we have a little bit more data um, talking about um, you know, people thinking that programming is more for men. That means that girls thought it might be a little bit more for them. Um, and then thinking about different things, growth mindset, the fact that I can do it, not that I have to be naturally talented to do something. Um, went the, uh, the fixed mindset went down for girls who actually saw equal luminous. And then we also had some data about ratings of careers in science, right? So um, in this measure, girls rated the extent to which they pictured um, ex a, a, a career in STEM as being fascinating. So just going back to these pictures here, it's really interesting to think about how just changing a number from having six out of eight to four out of eight male and female characters can have that much impact on a set of players. Um, this, is, this is something that, you know, as a designer, I don't know if I would have believed either. And it's one of those ideas of like, wow, you know, how do we, how can we be careful in this way that we're trying to get at um, being supportive of more diverse audiences and more diverse players. So um, I have some specific strategies listed here. Um, tackling bi biases is a core part of your design goals. You know, distrust or at least question that designer instinct. Um, intermix content and representation. This is something when you saw those party games that don't look like they're really doing stuff about bias and they're not showing pictures of people and yet they're still working. Um, be careful of expertise and its fixity. Um, you don't have publishers uh, saying to you that you know no way that a gamer would ever play as a female character. That is a very fixed mindset. That man will be very sad in 20 years when he realizes that he was behind in the times. And there's a whole lot of people who play different kind of games than he wants to support. Um, and understand that these venues, publishing, crowdfunding, are not necessarily equitable. And so we have to make extra support for people who are going and are at risk and are not necessarily part of the demographic who is worth, uh, uh, who has been supported before in, in crowdfunding. Um, we have to find ways that we can have discovery and also failure. The fact that you can keep trying again and, and find people to maybe even help you uh, think about the research questions. Um, so there's one thing I just want to leave us with today as we, as we, as we wrap up Indicade. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I, there's so much to talk about. Diversity in games has been my lifelong interest. Um, uh, I have this huge manifesto, you know, as some of you from know from reading Critical Play, I'm a fan of 20th century art manifestos. I know there's already a talk about art manifestos here, so I took take the liberty of proposing this manifesto for our eclectic community. But then I thought, well, you know, um, I realize that I, I actually can't speak for everyone in this room, and um, there's no way I could possibly represent all of our concerns um, as uh, from my perspective. I mean, that's what diversity is, after all. So I thought maybe... Maybe, maybe we could, each of us might think about 
how we would define our own personal manifesto regarding diversity in gaming and game design and commit to principles as a community of openness, engagement, and invitation. And how can we do that, not just in principle, but in practice? What, is, what does that look like to go out of our way to make sure we're engaging in openness, engagement, and invitation, to make sure that everybody plays games, everybody makes games, everybody is in the games. You know, playing and making games is not the exclusive domain of a privileged few. Games are for everyone, and anyone should be able to make them. What we put in our games, as I've shown you, can literally change our minds, so we need to be um, more aware of what influences players um, and, and helps them be more open-minded, care about others, become better people, et cetera, et cetera. So in this talk, I hope you found a few techniques or research tidbits to help players uh, to relate to pro-social issues and possibly um, engage with them and to each other and the world around us. The time is now <laughs> to invent what games can be and who makes them. Um, ingenious anthropologist Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And when I think of this community, I think of those words. And that means indie to me. So thank you very much. I look forward to learning from everybody in this room. And we must commit to being learners, not experts. And um, so that, to me, is what diversity in gaming is all about. So I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you. <laughs>